uh, first speaker will be uh, Dr. Munir Jiwa, who is the founding director of the Center for Islamic Studies and assistant professor of Islamic studies at the Graduate Theological Union. He holds a PhD and master's in philosophy and anthropology from Columbia University and an MTS in world religious religions from Harvard Divinity School. His research interests include Islam and Muslims in the West, media, athletics, religious pluralism, and interfaith dialogue. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Munir Jiwa. But I, I do want to thank uh, all the organizers, of course, Dr. Uh, Hatham Bazian and uh, the GTU team, uh, as well as all the volunteers and all of those who um, are here today. Thank you for uh, joining us. Um, I just have a few sort of notes to begin with, and I think as we proceed, you'll hear different perspectives uh, on this topic of um, Islamophobia. Um, I want to just maybe share some of the research I've been doing and some of the work that's been happening at the Center for Islamic Studies as well, um, in terms of how uh, academia is now kind of taking uh, this topic uh, seriously as an, a formal study. Um, and I think uh, we move from just anecdotal instances um, uh, where we hear about Islamophobia and it's not real to people, um, you know, and yet we know that it's uh, plaguing our communities uh, and the racism is far and wide. So I think this, um, the important part of actually researching Islamophobia, documenting it and having it as an academic area um, that takes both the kind of seriousness of what's going on in our communities at large what's going on in Muslim communities, and how we can actually reflect on these um, uh, very serious issues uh, academically. Um, I also want to just uh, thank the family, uh, the Barakat and uh, uh, Abu Salha family, um, and we pray uh, that uh, Allah uh, grant them uh, courage uh, and strength uh, in, in, in their loss, um, and uh, we pray that uh, Allah grant uh, Dia Barakat, Yusur, and Razan uh, Jannah and uh, accept all their service. Um, it's uh, a sad occasion to gather um, in, in, in knowing that, uh, as the title says, uh, Islamophobia is deadly, uh, you know, and that th these are the kind of extremes that we're seeing. So it's not just something that we hear about that's out there that the media is doing, but this actually has real life repercussions. Uh, including uh, uh, death. Um, so um, we want to honor them and their memory as well, uh, and we pray that uh, God uh, keep uh, their family um, uh, safe. I want to maybe just highlight a few ways in which we might think about Islamophobia and some of the ways in which um, academics are trying to, um, uh, trying to uh, discuss these uh, topics. And of course, the uh, Center for uh, Race and Genders program on the Islamophobia documentation, research and documentation project that Dr. Hassan Bazian has been directing has been uh, pioneering in, in this work. And it's, it's uh, one, I think, the only center of its kind um, and the only place that's actually doing this within an academic uh, framework. So I think um, the community needs to get behind this, um, academics need to get behind this, and the larger, not just Muslim communities, but the larger communities, I think, need to be behind this because Islamophobia is not something that just happens to Muslims. Um, it's not just the fear of Islam and Muslims, but it's a larger racism uh, that's plaguing our, our, our societies, uh, and it affects all of us. Um, so there, many of you have heard this before, but if you just indulge me, I want to look at some of the media frames and how Islam and Muslims have come to be understood in the public sphere. Um, and it's what I've been calling the five media pillars of Islam. So 9-11 um, ends up being this kind of organizing frame of how we think about uh, Islam and Muslims. It's like the temporal marker. Uh, it's when Muslims kind of make it on, on the stage, and of course it's not uh, a very positive entry for Muslims on the kind of national and global stage. Um, what 9-11 marks is an important turning point in realizing our, our own sort of American uh, place in the larger global, um, uh, in the global world, right? That we're no longer just this kind of exceptional American uh, power, but that, that our power is in relationship to the rest of the world. 
I think 9-11 uh, also forgets the long history of Muslims in the United States. So we often think that we, st you know, we start learning about Islam and Muslims after 9-11, but it forgets the long history of Muslims in this country, including uh, the indigenous Muslims, African-American Muslims who were here uh, right uh, at, at, uh, during the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade. So I think um, we should uh, remind ourselves and communities at large that there's a longer history uh, of Islam in America and the positive role that Muslims have played in this country uh, right from its uh, start. The second sort of frame, the problematic frame, is whenever we think about Islam and Muslims, and especially in, uh, these are frames that actually get carried out in the academic environment as well, is the frame of uh, violence or terrorism. Um, you cannot talk about Islam and Muslims today, including in the classrooms, without talking about terrorism. And if you uh, say terrorism today, people immediately think Islam or Muslims, right? I mean, it's almost, these are interchangeable terms. Um, and so you don't even generally need to qualify terrorism anymore. Terrorism equates, uh, you know, to uh, Muslim uh, terrorism uh, or Islamic terrorism. So this is a kind of second frame, the problematic frame in which we've come to think about Islam and Muslims through this trope of, of uh, violence and terrorism. Words like jihad, uh, madrasa, uh, these are Taliban, Al Qaeda. These are all English words, um, you know, and they it's it's they're related to Islam and Muslims. So uh, kids, uh, school children know these terms, right? And when they know these terms, they know them in relationship to Islam and Muslims. So I think we need to also think about this not just uh, as an issue for um, uh, adults, but this is what's being taught right from you know primary school. So Islamophobia is really affecting uh, all age groups inter and generations, and I think we need to take seriously the way in which it's particularly affecting um, school children as well. Uh, the third frame is the frame of um, Muslim women and so-called Muslim women's oppression, and especially debates on on the veil, right, and veiling. And I think. Um, and, and, and sort of new debates on, uh, on sexuality. And I think that this is, uh, of course, a kind of obsession of the West. We've seen that it has a long colonial history, the obsession with saving Muslim women from Muslim men, or colonial sort of divide and rule of Muslim societies by what we would call a sexual divide and rule of male and female. So it's kind of um, what in academic terms, Gayatri Spivak, a theorist, has called um, you know, white men saving brown women from brown men. Um, and it's about sort of this saving trope, and you see that continuing um, in uh, sort of imperial policies. Uh, take, for example, the war on Afghanistan, where, the, uh, where uh, a lot of the rationale for the war made by Bush, not known as a feminist um, at home, uh, you know, or really caring about women's rights at home, but highly concerned with women's rights in Afghanistan, so much so that a war was logged, launched, and generations, again, who have lost hope uh, in a society. So the idea is that Muslim communities are lagging behind. The reason they're lagging behind is because Muslim, we Muslim men are oppressing Muslim women, and the sign of that and the marker of that in Afghanistan uh, in particular was the burqa. So if we can, the logic is if we can just get women to be uh, you know, less tied to their veils, and uh, start unveiling, we move Muslim societies out of tradition and into modernity, and they would be more like us. So this is part of the kind of demo democracy abroad or the freedom project abroad, where Muslim women are particularly um, central to that project or saving them is central to that project. The fourth pillar is, uh, what I've been calling the fourth media pillar, is the um, trope of Islam and the West. You know, as if they're kind of um, uh, two different entities. Well, they are, but geographic entities as if Islam belongs somewhere in the East and uh, the West is, you know, somewhere else. And, it, and as I uh, opened with, there's a long history of Islam and Muslims in the West, um, in the West, right, and including in Europe. Um, the other part of that is that you cannot think about Islam in the West today without thinking about the contributions of Islam and Muslims who have helped one would argue even the Renaissance in Europe was due to the thinking that had gone on in the Muslim world. So I think it's an important reminder to us that whenever we hear these kind of divisions about Islam and the West, or a class of civilizations, civilizations, that we work against these tropes. First, because Muslims have been in the West for a long time, 
including, as I mentioned, African-American Muslims, uh, Muslims in Bosnia, Muslims all over Europe. Um, and the second is because it perpetuates this idea that there's a clash of values, that somehow Islamic values are not compatible with Western values, um, whatever those things mean, right? Um, and that Islam sort of is, doesn't, is not sort of compatible with democracy. So this trope of Islam in the West seems to otherize Islam as something alien to the West or something belonging outside of uh, Europe or America. And then the last trope is uh, the one of the Middle East. So if 9-11 provides a kind of temporal framework of when Muslims enter this kind of national stage in America, uh, the Middle East is the kind of focus, the ge geographic focus of where we uh, often fo um, uh, you know, position ourselves vis-a-vis -vis the Muslim world or how we come to think about Muslims. Um, and usually when we think about the Middle East, we're not thinking about, you know, the sort of aesthetics or the contribution of Islamic sciences or Arabic uh, sciences to the West. We're usually thinking about politics, war, uh, and the like. The problem with this trope is also that we often hear people saying, well, most Muslims don't really, you know, live in the Middle East and most Muslims not Arabs. We have to, I think, just remind ourselves that this kind of distancing of our, ourselves from Arabs, I often find it in the communities that I'm from, South Asian communities, we often hear, uh, well, we're not Arab, right? And I said, the problem is not that whether we're Arab or not, the problem is that this affects all of us, right? So um, this idea that, yes, Muslims are uh, most numerous in Indonesia, uh, largest sort of geographic space of Muslims is in South Asia, we have to remind ourselves that, yes, that's important for, uh, for a larger community to know and for Muslims to know, but that it shouldn't create uh, a way in which to divide us. Right, or that it increases the kind of um, essentialization of Arabs as being the particular problems and other Muslims are okay. Um, so we have to just be mindful of when we're looking at the Middle East that we're not um, uh, furthering a kind of political divisions or uh, ones that divide um, our uh, communities. I want to just move, uh, in the interest of time, I just want to move to this new project that we're seeing in the West, and Dr. Hakim's going to be talking about it, I think, tomorrow at his lecture at the GTU as well. Um, there's a particular problem of not just seeing uh, Islamophobia in the kind of um, uh, political sphere, right? People often want to talk, talk about Islamophobia or the fear of Islam and Muslims in a religious and theological sense. So often in academia, when we're in a classroom, students will come and say, well, what does the Quran say about violence, right? And I argue that this is a problem for a variety of reasons. First, that we conflate this kind of socio-political, economic issues, the military issues in the world today, with somehow being about the religion of Islam, right? That the answers are in the Quran or the prophetic paradigm. And I would argue that's a, a misguided way in which to approach um, uh, the problem at hand. The problem and the focus should be on the socio-political, economic militarism of the West and America in its relationship to the Muslim world. You know, it's not that all of a sudden Muslims are waking up and, you know, turning pages to uh, the Quran and filing, finding the violent passages and saying, aha, we're going to be violent today. <laughs> you know, it's part of a long historical process of uh, the way in which Western powers uh, uh, intimidate uh, Muslims, intimidate Islam, and this, so there's a reform project of Islam itself, which is, uh, the, the misunderstanding is that because Islam, the religion, is the problem, we need to reform Muslims, and, and that reform looks like um, something like the fact that Muslims should be less tied to their religion. They shouldn't actually take the Quran to be the word of God. The Prophet, yes, uh, should be an example, but we shouldn't be so attached to him either. So the reform project is actually asking Muslims to become more secular, or the way in which Christians live their lives, to be, you know, to think of your religion as just something symbolic, as something you're not so attached to. And the logic is that if you're less tied to religion, you're more likely to be liberated and free. And of course, this, all the statistics when it comes to Islam and Muslims show the opposite. In fact, the more tied you are to mosque communities, the more learned you are of your tradition, um, the less likely you are to uh, engage in acts of violence. Um, and we can see that in different kinds of movements. The Islamic feminist movement that's not taking Western feminism as their example, but is actually going back to the Quran um, and the word of God as their liberation, right? So I think there's a lot to offer from within the tradition um, uh, back to sort of uh, the kind of Western canon 
um, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's important. Um, I maybe just end with uh, a few recommendations. So in, um, in a center of, like ours, the Center for Islamic Studies at the Graduate Theological Union, we are um, a center in the context of an interfaith environment. So we have several seminaries that are um, Christian. We have a Center for Jewish Studies, Center for Islamic Studies, and Institute for Buddhism. And, um, and we do a lot of work also with UC Berkeley. And mashallah, now that Zaytuna is credited, uh, we also extend our work with Zaytuna College. Um, and one of the things we find is that um, there are few spaces uh, like this, where we can actually study uh, Islam and Muslims without being, uh, without apologizing for our tradition, right? So when you're in a context like the GTU, you have the opportunity to study a faith tradition, and many others study Islam as well, not just Muslims, and many Muslims also study other faith traditions, right? But you are not apologizing for being a practicing or a committed Muslim. Um, you're not apologizing for actually finding some of your responses to things in the Quran. Um, and that this actually has a place. So I think the communities here, our communities need to be aware of the fact that there are spaces where uh, this research is possible. Uh, there are not a lot of them, and there's a lot of pushback, of course, but there, that we need to um, uh, think of these spaces as positive spaces for us, you know, where we can do our research, where we can do our work, and where we are in conversation with folks from other religious traditions who mean well, you know, who are there to work with us um, and I think that's a really important part of this and to remain positive about it as well um, so that we just don't think that there is this kind of uh, Islamophobia that is deadly, of course, and that is uh, horrifying and that is alarming uh, and there's an industry around it, right? This, uh, there's an entire sort of good Muslim, bad Muslim industry where, you know, the more secular Muslims get to make it mainstream and in politics and the more practicing Muslims are seen as the bad Muslims and, and differentiated. I think we need to recognize that there are spaces in which we can counter that. We can counter this clash of good Muslim, bad Muslim. We can counter the clash of uh, Islam and Muslims belonging somewhere out there. Um, and I think we need to use all the spaces that are available to us, including in academia. Um, we often don't think about academia as a place that uh, can provide that space for Muslim communities. But I think we need to see it as a space that we engage uh, these things. And more Muslims need to start stepping up to um, speaking for ourselves, um, for uh, sharing our stories. You know, um, too much of academia is filled with other people telling our stories. And there are, again, many sympathetic voices, uh, non-Muslim voices, but Muslims also need to be empowered to step up and, and, um, and share their voices. I might want to end on a note that just um, shows this kind of definition of um, Islamophilia and Islamophobia. Um, and looks at the way in which good Muslim and bad Muslim are differentiated and maybe uh, something that we need to sort of work against. Um, but you'll sort of see the humor in it and I'm hoping that I, I could just end with that and, um, and you'll sort of see that it's something that we need to somehow work um, against. Uh, so it reads, um, and this is from a book called Islamophobia, Islamophilia. Uh, the good Muslim as a stereotype has common features he tends to be a Sufi, ideally one who reads Rumi. He is peaceful and assures us that jihad is an inner spiritual struggle and contest, not a struggle to, uh, not a struggle to enjoin the good and forbid the wrong through force or arms. He treats women as equals and is committed to choice in matters of hijab wearing and never advocates the covering of, of a woman's face. If he, is, if he is a she, then she is highly educated works outside the home, is her husband's only wife, chose her husband freely, and wears hijab, if at all, only because she wants to. The good Muslim is also a pluralist, recalls fondly the ecumenical virtues of medieval Andalusia, and as a champion of interfaith activism. He is politically moderate, an advocate of democracy, human rights, and religious freedom, and an opponent of armed conflict against the US and Israel. Finally, he is likely to be an African, a South Asian, or more likely still, an Indonesian or Malaysian. He is less likely to be an Arab, but as friends of good Muslims will point out, only a small proportion of Muslims are Arab anyway. <laughs> so I'll just end on that note, and I know other speakers have a lot more to say about the kind of 
is Islamophobia industry and the kind of economics behind it. But I thought these opening frames might be useful and inshallah we'll continue to have a good conversation here and beyond. Thank you and assalamu alaikum.